Welcome everybody to the Johnson Matthey Platinum Group Metals Conference, Critical to the Future of Sustainable Technology. So what is the role of PGMs in the future technologies or those technologies that are going to allow us to have a beautiful, sustainable and successful future as human beings on our wonderful planet? My name is Dr. Sarah Gordon. Now, before we get started, or basically the bit that you have all been waiting for, because of course this is a conference and Emma, I'm going to invite you to maybe say some words against this particular slide. Uh, because of course this is a Johnson Matthey conference, there is a little bit of a legal disclaimer we need to flash up at the beginning in front of you. We will put this into chat as well if any of you want to read this in detail. So with that, I'm going to stop sharing and I'm going to welcome Moritz to the stage um, to offer us some words of welcome and to get today's session rolling. Moritz, over to yourself. Thank you very much, Sarah, for a very warm welcome. Uh, hello, everyone. A great pleasure to have you all on the line. Great pleasure to be here and to be opening this uh, this session of the conference. My name is Maurits van Tol and the Chief Technology Officer of Johnson Matthey. When I look outside, I'm sitting in London. It's 14 centigrade. The sun is shining. When you're on the continent or in many different countries, and you do that at the moment, there's even night temperatures of 36 centigrade in some countries on the continent of Europe, for example. And there's forest fires all around the world, reminding us very vividly of climate change and its detrimental effect uh, on, on the planet. And I think that's the bridge I want to build to this session here today, because today it's about the crucial role of PGMs in the transition towards net zero. Um, PGMs feature everywhere in that journey, in that net zero journey. Johnson Matthews, uh, Marge Ryan will address the myths and facts about the availability of platinum for this major new market in fuel cells. And with that, I really wish you all uh, a very pleasant and uh, educational uh, and entertaining uh, and interactive morning. And I would like to hand back to Sarah. Sarah, please. Round of applause for Moritz, everybody. Thank you very much for the opening. Brilliant. So without further ado, I'm going to welcome, as Moritz has just said, I'm going to welcome the fabulous Marge Ryan to the stage. As I said, she is back by popular demand. She's already given one talk this week, um, but she is the go-to person when it comes to all things PGMs, um, and especially with regards to understanding it as being a crucial enabler of the energy transition, of course, referring to the Johnson Matthey white paper. So I'll just let Marge share her slides and find that mute button whilst I hand across okay. to, uh, to Marge to, to be able to give this talk. Now, of course, within this, Marge has filled my head up with a huge amount of information on PGMs, but I'm looking forward to hearing a little bit more. So we'll let you hit the presentation mode. There we go. Um, everybody, please put your hands together for the fabulous Marge Ryan. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sarah. Um, I should say I'm speaking on behalf of not just my team, which is the Platinum Group Metals Market Research Team at Johnson Matthey. So I've got a team of 12 amazing analysts supporting me in all this, but on behalf of Johnson Matthey as a whole, because of course we are a PGM company. So I had the privilege of speaking to you on Tuesday and, and now I'm lucky enough to get to do it again. And I'm going to focus in today on Platinum as a crucial enabler of the energy transition. And as, as Sarah and Maritz have said, this is because we recently published a white paper on the subject. And we did this because we really see Platinum as presenting a really significant opportunity to unlock some of the challenges we face in the transition to net zero. And we wanna be sure that that opportunity is fully recognized, fully understood, so that it can, it can be fully exploited. So let's get into it, I'm gonna minimize that. Right, and another disclaimer, this is the best one, of course, but it just says nothing I say should be construed as investment advice or advice to do anything in particular. So in the next 20 minutes or so, I'm going to start with a little bit of scene setting. So I'm not really going to get into this debate of why hydrogen, why fuel cell vehicles. I think most people accept there is now a role for them. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a look at this question of why hydrogen, why fuel cell vehicles from the perspective of minerals. This is a metals conference. So I'm going to consider this question from a minerals, from a metals perspective. 
I'm then going to talk about platinum and hydrogen technologies. Just to be clear, platinum does have a number of energy transition applications, uh, including, for example, in the production of sustainable fuels. But I'm going to focus on hydrogen technologies and specifically within that on fuel cell vehicles. And the reason for that is we really see fuel cell vehicles as being the single biggest needle mover in terms of new demand for platinum. I'll then take a look at the profile of platinum supply and demand. Now, of course, supply and demand was discussed quite a lot on Tuesday, but what I'm going to do is just take a snapshot view of platinum supply and demand today and what that tells us about the readiness of this metal for a new application. And then directly from that, I'll come on to this question of whether there is enough platinum for fuel cell vehicles. I'm then going to talk briefly about cost because we do still sometimes hear people saying that fuel cell vehicles are expensive because they use platinum and if you took the platinum out the fuel cell vehicle cost would come down and I'm going to show that's a total fallacy and then I'm going to wrap it all up and discuss what we see as the platinum opportunity. So let's start with the scene setting and the backdrop to this, the scene is that the energy transition will be mineral intense. We know this. This, for example, is a, a slide from the International Energy Agency, just showing how minerals demand for clean energy technologies will ramp up massively between now, so that's 2020 and 2040, depending on the rapidity of the transition to net zero. So clearly we want to be using one of those more uh, uh, aggressive scenarios to decarbonize. And we're looking at anything between four times and six times as much mineral demand for these clean energy technologies. So we are moving to an economy powered by renewable energy. We are not moving to a renewable economy. We are still going to have to rely on the extraction of a finite resource and that's minerals because you can't exploit renewable energy without minerals. So we're moving from the extraction of one finite resource with an environmental impact to the extraction of a finite resource with an environmental impact. So that said, two key aspects need focus. The first is that we need to maximize our potential to decarbonize and deliver prosperity, because of course we need a just transition, but we need to do that within the constraints of geology and environmental systems. The earth is a finite system, there are obviously constraints. So this requirement needs a mix of technologies because that's how you do that. You use a mix of technologies that complement each other and that allows you to optimize your energy system and maximize your decarbonization potential within constraints. And the second thing we need to do is we need to use our minerals as efficiently as possible. So what does this mean? for the vehicle market in particular. And it means this. So I presented this slide on Tuesday. It's essentially showing a scenario. There are many scenarios. This is just an example of how vehicle powertrain will have to evolve as we transition to net zero. And net zero means that we want a net zero road vehicle fleet on the road soon after 2050. So that means we're going to have to get new vehicle sales uh, to a situation where they decarbonize. So this is a chart of new vehicle sales, and it shows you the sort of thing we're looking at, which is that vehicles with engines, including hybrids, the production of those will ultimately have to decline probably to zero. And then we're going to see electrification doing the heavy lifting on decarbonization here. And that's going to be mainly battery electric vehicles, but crucially also fuel cell electric vehicles, because we need a mix of technologies. These two complement each other, and that's a whole conversation on how they don't actually compete. They have different advantages and disadvantages. So use them each where they're best suited because they complement each other. But the point is that if you use both, this will allow us to optimize energy efficiency which is important, it is important, but we're not going to run out of the wind, we're not going to run out of the sun, so we need to optimize mineral efficiency as well. We have to do both. So what do we mean by mineral efficiency? Um, I think it's pretty obvious, so energy efficiency, that's essentially how much energy do you use to do a thing, and mineral efficiency is how, much, how many minerals, how much metal do you use to do a thing. And the thing we are doing in this particular example is we're making a medium passenger car and you can see their typical critical metal contact content per passenger car depending on the type. So gasoline cars used a certain amount of these critical metals, including a bit of PGM, so there's a sliver of dark pink there, but you use the PGM in gram quantities, not kilogram quantities, so only a sliver. 
fuel cell vehicle uses somewhat more critical metals, so 41 kilograms as opposed to 33 kilograms, and also a sliver of PGM. And in this instance, that's the platinum in the fuel cell. But a battery electric vehicle, we are looking at using significantly more critical metals. So battery electric vehicles we know offer great energy efficiency, uh, depending on with where the renewable energy is generated because you don't have those energy conversions. So you get the energy efficiency with the BEVs, but you get the mineral efficiency with the fuel cell vehicles. So you use them together. Now, mineral efficiency is not a new concept in PGMs. We have focused on this routinely for a long time. We call it thrifting. And here's the example of how thrifting or a reduction in platinum intensity of use has already happened in fuel cells. And this is, this is pre-commercial R&D that's delivered this increase in efficiency. And you can see the loadings of uh, platinum in fuel cells over the last 30 years have already come down by an order of magnitude. And of course, now we're moving into the commercial scale up phase. So with only intensif intensified focus on this, we know there is more to come. So loadings will fall further. So let's move on to platinum in hydrogen technologies. Where is it used? So the main one here is proton exchange membrane technology, and that's uh, proton exchange membrane electrolyzers, which is one of the electrolyzer technologies that you use to make green or renewable hydrogen. And you do benefit again from a mix of electrolyzer technologies there. And proton exchange membrane fuel cells, which are the technology that fuel cell vehicles rely on. And platinum as an electrocatalyst is crucial in both PEM fuel cells and PEM electrolyzers. Platinum is also other, used in other fuel cell technologies, such as phosphoric acid fuel cells for power generation, stationary power generation, and in various settings in fuel or carrier processing for fuel cells as well. And it can also be used as a platinum anti-corrosion plating, and that's quite typical in PEM electrolyzers. But what, we, what I'm focusing on is PEM fuel cells, and specifically PEM fuel cells in vehicles, because as I said, that's going to be the big needle mover here in terms of demand. So platinum supply and demand, what does that look like? What does it tell us? Well, the headline there is that platinum is a well-supplied metal that is ready for a new market. So let's take a look at platinum supply. Platinum benefits from well-established supply from both primary and secondary sources. So we've got those mines in Southern Africa. We discussed those on Tuesday. Those are well-established mines run by large listed companies with a long track record, exploiting a deposit that really is quite vast. So we've got those uh, mines with sufficient investment they can keep producing for decades. And then on the recycling side, on the secondary supply side, we've got this urban mine of platinum, which is scrapped catalytic converters. And you can see already 16% of platinum supply from that source uh, and with some other recycling providing secondary metal as well. Now, scrapped catalytic converters, there's still a lot of uh, catalytic converters in use out there. There's still a lot of platinum going on to catalytic converters because platinum is uh, crucial, particularly for cleaning up diesel vehicle exhaust. So that's still a robust demand area for platinum and that'll continue for some time to use platinum. So that urban mine is going to be out there uh, for a, a long period uh, as a source of platinum to the market. If we then look at how supply meets demand, you can see actually we are uh, predicting uh, slightly excess supply this year, about five tons. But this is not unusual. Uh, the platinum market is quite often in surplus. And if we consider the industrial level, so that's if we exclude investment demand, which I've left off this chart, but if we also exclude jewelry demand, so the price elastic areas of demand, at the industrial level, platinum is consistently in surplus. And there's a number of reasons for this. Uh, platinum is not mined in isolation. It's mined uh, in Southern Africa with its co-products, palladium and rhodium. And they're in, in high demand at the moment for catalytic converters. And of course, in terms of recycling, the value of platinum means there's no point. Not, you, you're always going to recycle if you've got that metal to recycle. So this is the situation. We've got a well-supplied metal. And if we look at the demand profile, that large catalytic converter market in the pink there, so some of that pink is fuel cell vehicles, most of it is still catalytic converters. That will decline in future. We know that that's what the energy transition tells us. And then you've got that jewelry market, which has been in decline 
for the past 10 years. That looks to be stabilizing now, but platinum jewelry demand is smaller now than it used to be. And I'll come back to that in a later slide. So this metal really is ready for a new application, a large new application, and that application is fuel cell vehicles. And this means that platinum, almost uniquely among critical metals, will see rising de demand in these new energy transition applications, naturally replacing declining demand in traditional fossil fuel applications. And there's one more fossil fuel application in there, of course, which is petroleum refining, and I'm going to revisit that in a later slide. So this question then, is there enough platinum for fuel cell vehicles? So we did a, an, a theoretical exercise, a scenario exercise. It is in the white paper. If you want to see that in more detail, I'm going to talk through it at, at quite a high level. The reason we did this, it's not a forecast, it's a scenario. And what it's intended to show is that you can scale fuel cell vehicle production up to high volume, so mass production, within existing platinum supply levels. So a theoretical exercise to demonstrate that. Let's take a look. So what we have done is we've assumed a certain amount of availability of platinum for fuel cell vehicles every year. And that's in the pink line and that can be read off the right-hand axis. We've started that at 45 tons in 2023 because there are a lot of platinum stocks out there we know they are market stocks, so we've simply assumed 45 tons of those are used in 2023. And then we've increased the availability, the assumed availability in every year up to 2040, where we set it at 130 tons in that year and then held it flat. Now, why 130 tons? Well, 130 tons is a bit less than the amount of platinum currently going into catalytic converters and jewelry. So the implicit assumption there is that uh, catalytic converter and jewellery demand for platinum on a net basis declines to near zero by 2040. Remember, not a, not a forecast, but a scenario and not, a, a, not an unreasonable scenario. But essentially what we're saying is that platinum's fossil fuel based and other applications give up enough metal that this is the availability for fuel cell vehicles. And then we've taken that assumed amount of metal and worked out how many fuel cell vehicles we can make with it. And we've done two things. We've tested two thrifting cases. So in the dark blue, we have a 50% thrift case. And in the turquoise, we've got a 67% thrift case. So we know there's going to be thrifting. We know the platinum loading on fuel cell vehicles will continue to come down, particularly over this time frame to 2050. You have to build it into your projections. Uh, and we've assumed either half the metal gets taken out or two thirds, essentially, now, uh, both of which are quite uh, reasonable projections. And then we've done one more thing. We've tested the effect of closed loop recycling. So what do we mean by closed loop recycling? Well, in most of Platinum's applications today, there is a closed loop recycling metal and retaining it within the application. So we assume the same thing happens to fuel cell vehicle stacks at end of life. So that when you make those fuel cell vehicles, eventually, they, are, they reach the end of their lives and they scrapped. And we've just assumed that platinum is recovered and put back into new fuel cell vehicles. So the dashed lines give you the, the cases without that closed loop recycling and the solid lines give you with the closed loop recycling added back in. So if we do the 50% thrift case, if we thrift from 45 grams per vehicle today to 23 grams per vehicle in 2050 and recycle, this allows 10% overall share of the vehicle market in 2050. And this is the total vehicle market we've projected here. So that's cars, vans, buses, and trucks. So how would a 10% overall share break down? Well, light vehicles are a lot more numerous than heavy vehicles. So 10% overall share could look like fuel cell vehicles being used in all commercial vehicles, heavy vehicles over six tons, and taking a 6% share in light vehicles with batteries obviously doing most of the heavy lifting there. If we thrift more aggressively, so if we thrift from 45 grams of, uh, per vehicle today to 15 grams per vehicle in 2050 and do that closed loop recycling, this allows a 16% overall share of the vehicle market in 2050, which again would allow fuel cell vehicles to be, uh, fuel cells to be used in all vehicles over six tons and in 12% of light vehicles. So playing quite an important role in decarbonizing 
the vehicle market. Again, remember this is not a forecast, but these are the kind of shares that fall out of our availability exercise. Just an, a word on, on loadings, that 45 grams per vehicle today, that does sound quite high. There is less than that going on fuel cell cars today, but what that is, it's a, a weighted average across all vehicle classes. So we've looked at our model for fuel cell vehicle demand, and we've worked out the weighted average across fuel cell cars, vans, buses, and trucks, and that gives you 45 grams per, day, uh, per vehicle today. And then that falls through the nearly 30 year period. So 15 grams per vehicle weighted average in 2050, what could that look like? Well, it could look like eight grams per fuel cell car and average of 32 grams per uh, commercial vehicle. So, you know, those are the sort of loadings that are in line with ex expectations over the longer term. So what we've done here is a scenario exercise to show how mass production of fuel cell vehicles could sit within existing platinum supply levels. But we don't have to fit into existing supply levels because there is other metal out there to supplement availability. So stocks, as discussed on Tuesday, can play that role of absorbing short-term imbalances. And certainly we know platinum does benefit from stocks that can certainly supplement availability. Release of above ground metal could play a role. And I'm gonna look at a couple of examples in a minute and increased supplies as well. So we know there is scope for increased recycling. Uh, we know catalytic converters are recycled at high efficiency, but collection rates are still not quite as high as they could be. And we, we average losses, we estimate average around 30%. So there's a bit of headroom there to increase recycling and potentially also increase mining because there's certainly enough metal in the ground to do that in the longer term. So I've mentioned above ground, hold, uh, uh, above ground stocks of platinum, and an example of that is investment holdings of platinum, which are significant. So on this chart, we show our uh, estimate of platinum physical investment demand since 1990. So what I've done is I've set uh, 1990 at zero and then just added up all the metal we have tracked going into physical investment products over the period. So that's physically backed ETFs, bars and coins. And you can see that we estimate that since 1990, over 300 tons of platinum have been purchased by investors. And this obviously constitutes a stock of metal that could come back to market in future. I mean, it will come back in future because as an investor, you don't buy metal unless you're planning to sell it at some point. Now, what about jewelry? Because jewelry has certainly absorbed a lot of metal. And here we show uh, jewelry demand on the left. So this is uh, our estimates of platinum going into jewelry every year. Uh, uh, the pink line is net of recycling and the blue line is gross. We started reporting gross and net separately in 2005. And you can see how at a gross level in the blue there, that demand has really fallen off very sharply from the peak in 2013. And we're starting to see some leveling off uh, there. But if we look on a net level, you can see that platinum jewelry demand really is sitting well below the peak it saw around the turn of the millennium and possibly still dropping off a bit there because there's certainly scope for more recycling of platinum jewelry. And on the right there, I've done a similar sort of chart as the previous one where I've started at zero in 1990 and then just added up all the jewelry uh, demand in our numbers and that's gotten to over 2000 tons cumulatively, but then the pink is the amount of jewelry that we know has already been recycled, that metal's already been returned. So you know, nearly 2000 tons of platinum still out there as jewelry. Now, most of that is not gonna come back. People are not in the habit of selling their uh, platinum wedding rings or their beautiful platinum earrings and necklaces. So most of that jewelry, most of that platinum is not going to come back but some of it certainly could, particularly in the more price sensitive and more price aware markets in the East where there is a culture of jewelry recycling. And you can see there's certainly scope for a bit more recycling there, which could certainly act to moderate um, demand growth in jewelry. But we don't need this metal. You know, it's out there, there's a lot of it, but we don't need this metal to give us sufficient availability of platinum for fuel cell vehicles.
Now, what about platinum and petroleum refining? Because a number of people have asked about this. Um, there's been platinum going into petroleum refining for decades. I've just added up since 1975, but it was used before 1975 as well. But since 1975, you can see over 200 tons of platinum have gone into petroleum refining. And that's in the form of catalysts. And most of it is still there, but some of it has definitely been lost, hence the shading on this chart. Uh, some of it over time, you always have small losses, attritional losses, especially when you turn over your catalyst charges and closed loop, there's inevitably a tiny loss and that does add up. So some of it's gone, much of it remains installed and is recoverable and could be released in future as fossil fuel demand declines. So platinum catalysts and petroleum refining are particularly exposed to gasoline demand because they're mostly used to produce high octane gasoline blend stock. And we do know gasoline demand is going to decline in future. There's a bit of argument about when the peak will be or has it already happened and when will that decline be? But we do know that's gonna decline and that'll certainly release some platinum which will then become available for new uses such as sustainable fuels production. So again here, we've got a lovely example of the natural transition in platinum's demand profile from a fossil fueled application to its uh, clean energy equivalent. So what about cost? Because we still hear this question. So what we've done here is a worked example of the PGM cost contribution to total fuel cell vehicle cost. Uh, and we chose Toyota so that we could compare a fuel cell vehicle to a, a hybrid, an equivalent hybrid today. And there is information out there about how much platinum is on a Mirai 2. We, we got this information from the Nikkei. And we worked out that the platinum on a Mirai 2, so in the fuel cell stack, would cost you at today's prices just over $600. The Prius then, the PGM for the Prius is catalytic converters. We worked out at today's prices, that PGM would cost you just over $200. Now Mirai 2 is quite a lot more expensive to buy than a Prius. So in both cases, this cost of PGM works out to around 1% of the vehicle price. So similar proportion, clearly no one's put off buying Priuses because of the cost of PGM. And if you were to take all the platinum out of MRI 2, you would drop the vehicle price ever so slightly and it would make no difference and your fuel cell vehicle probably wouldn't work very well. So this is not the focus for reducing fuel cell vehicles costs. What will reduce fuel cell vehicle costs, we know this, it's understood across the industry, is economies of scale. Fuel cell vehicle cost will fall as production volumes increase. Battery electric vehicles, those costs have largely already been scaled out. That has not been the case in fuel cell vehicles yet, so it will come. So when the cost of a fuel cell vehicle comes down, let's say a future Mirai costs the same as a Prius today, but still uses the same amount of platinum as it uses today, and that would still be less than 3% of the price of the Prius, of the Mirai, so even at today's loadings. But we know platinum loadings are going to fall uh, on fuel cell vehicles. So bottom line is platinum cost is not a barrier to fuel cell vehicle deployment and nor is availability. And you've got that circularity because we already know you can recycle that platinum at end of life. So let's pull it all together then. What is the platinum opportunity? Platinum is an enabler of the energy transition. It benefits from two large established sources of supply, so primary and secondary. And the circularity in platinum already exists. It's, it's already routinely turned over in closed loop in many of its applications. There are substantial above ground stocks of platinum to supplement availability and below ground deposits that could be more exploited in future to support future availability. Platinum will see a natural shift away from fossil fuel based applications with fuel cell vehicles coming in as replacement demand. And then you've got that low and falling intensity of use, that's typical of the PGMs, which means that platinum functions as a store of value, which you can get back when you recycle that fuel cell vehicle stack without pushing up technology costs. It's not pushing up your fuel cell vehicle cost, but it is, uh, it is incentivizing your circularity. So the platinum opportunity, Platinum availability supports the scale up of fuel cell vehicles and other technologies. And in using those platinum catalyzed fuel cell vehicles, we can deliver a more sustainable, a more minerally efficient energy transition. Thank you.
Marge, as always, thank you so, so much for a phenomenal presentation. I have been receiving all kinds of comments behind the screen, uh, behind the scenes, with people saying, when I listen to Marge, she makes me feel so clever because I actually <laughs> understand it. So thank you very much. Round of applause from everyone here. That was that was great. Thank you for that. Thank you. Thanks, Sarah. <laughs> so, um, so question number one um that that comes in from somebody who is is not an expert with regards to the technology etc and they're asking okay so hang on a second we've got the technology we've got the platinum what's the barrier why why aren't we using this everywhere right now i mean we think it's coming um but essentially what it is is unlocking the chicken and egg problem which is we need the fueling infrastructure. And of course, BEV is benefited from being able to literally plug into the existing infrastructure. I mean, the challenges are going to come later, but with fuel cell vehicles, you've got that infrastructure barrier to overcome initially. And I mean, this it's not a simple problem to solve. You do need uh, supply and demand really to work together, and you need governments to play a role in kind of getting you to the point where the chicken and egg problem is solved and you've got the, the vehicles ready, but you've also got the infrastructure ready to fuel them. And we're seeing various approaches to this. We're seeing a lot of focus on hydrogen infrastructure in the US under IRA, uh, in the EU under the Green Deal and so on. But we're also seeing partnerships that are building up clusters of vehicles uh, and matching that to hydrogen refueling. So, you know, there's a bit of a challenge there, but we feel it can be overcome. And once we've done that, once we've unlocked that, um, and we get that scale in fuel cell vehicle production, because that's really what we need. We really need to get those volumes up. I think at this point, everything's just going to come together. And, and the scale going in, we, we, you know, Johnson Matthew announced its own gigafactory. So the scale is going in. The infrastructure has been looked at. Hydrogen costs are, are coming down with those incentives and so on. So it is all going to come together. But at the moment, we're still just putting the pieces of the puzzle together. And with that, then, Marge, there's a question here from John, and John's asking, will there be enough hydrogen manufactured to keep all of these new technologies supplied as, of course, it's not only the vehicles needing the hydrogen? What do you think there? Yeah, indeed. I mean, that's a, a really good question because we know there's a lot of um, pull for hydrogen now coming from the steel industry, for example, for a variety of different other uh, applications. And I think what it means is we've got to build up scale in hydrogen production quickly. Uh, again, what, what you benefit from is a mix of technologies. So you've got a mixture of electrolysis technologies. You're going to need all of them. You've also got your uh, CCS enabled hydrogen. And again, we feel there's a role for that because we do need to build that scale up. Again, if you look at the kind of gigafactory announcements on the uh, uh, electrolyzer side, those are increasing at pace. So that scale is coming. So, so yeah, we do need the hydrogen. It is certainly a focus of a lot of this uh, new regulation. Um, and I think actually what you get when you have a mixture of different users is that that almost enables the market because and we've kind of seen this, I think, in the US with the, the Department of Energy sort of creating these hydrogen hubs where it matches producers and users with, uh, with infrastructure. And they want a mix, those hydrogen hubs, they want them to be supplied by a mix of different hydrogen production technologies. And they want to see a mix of different consumers because that's how you really get your strength in your supply and demand equation. So I think it's coming. And that model that you've just cited there from the US, do you think that's a kind of nice plug and play to other countries around the world in terms of bringing together the right infrastructure, the demand, et cetera? Yeah, I think it's really nice, that kind of matchmaking in hydrogen. <laughs> there we go. Matchmaking in hydrogen. Awesome. Um, there's another question here from, from Arnie, who, who's asking, um, so looking at the, the volume of critical minerals that are required per vehicle, um, do you have any indication of, OK, so we, we know how much is required per vehicle, but then what about the volume of critical minerals that are required for the production of the energy to go into that? So, of course, Indeed. we see the differentiation between um, a fuel cell power vehicle and then a battery, which is much larger. But then what does this look like when you then bring in the infrastructure that's needed? And I would have loved to have talked about this, but I had to take some slides out to fit into my time. And we will actually be revisiting this exact subject in another white paper that's coming, very exciting. Um, but if you look at infrastructure and the IEA has a beautiful chart on critical metals per type of infrastructure, where you've got your high voltage cables using an enormous amount of copper and you've got your hydrogen pipeline, which 
barely appears makes a blip on the critical metal side. So again, it's the same sort of thing where if you have a mixture of infrastructure, mixture of cables and, and hydrogen, so mix your wires and pipes, use them in the right way. Again, you get to do this thing where you optimize energy efficiency as much as possible, but also optimize mineral efficiency. So that applies to uh, transmission infrastructure, this distribution infrastructure. For renewables generation, yes. If you already have a wind turbine, and it's right next to your vehicle market. So you can take that wind power and put it directly into your car. It makes sense to use that in a battery vehicle because you don't do two conversions. But the fact is we, we don't have all the renewable energy generation that we need. We have a massive, massive challenge ahead of us in terms of how much renewable power infrastructure we have to put in. And that's not all going to be sitting next to your cities ready to go directly into your vehicles. It's just not possible. We're going to have to put the solar power where the land is available, but crucially where the sun is so that your solar power generation is as efficient as possible. So North Africa, for example, you're going to have to put your wind where you've got the wind. And a lot of that is offshore, deep offshore. You're going to be looking at floating wind turbines. Now, again, getting that energy from your wind turbine and your solar panel, wherever it happens to be in the world, into your vehicle, wherever it happens to be in the world, well, again, hydrogen helps you to unlock that. It's one of those tools in your toolkit to unlock that infrastructure challenge. So yeah, a, a, a lovely subject to revisit in a future conversation, I think. Or oh, looking forward to that white paper when it comes out, Marge, it's going to be fantastic. Um, two more questions, if I may. And the first one is, so you, you showed us that graph of um, I think it was um, since 1990, 300 tons worth of platinum going into. And so I've got a vision of just these these bars of platinum sitting, looking very, very lonely or sorry for themselves, locked up in a safe somewhere. Given how useful platinum is, sure, surely that's wrong. <laughs> like surely we shouldn't just be sticking it in a bar and, and hiding it away surely we should be using that platinum I, I mean you, you could argue that for an industrial metal but I think the thing with platinum is it, it, it has been in surplus at an industrial level so we've wanted that investment and the point is that it does hold on to the metal in a form that is usable again so you, you wouldn't buy those bars and just I don't know, bury them in the ground and never see them again. They will come back. And we do know, we discussed on Tuesday, how important stocks are to the smooth functioning of the market. So that I think investment has a role to play. You could then have a separate conversation about at what price it comes back. Now, we won't go there. That's a different conversation. But um, if we do, it's just worth saying that low intensity of platinum use in fuel cell vehicles, even if we were to see a price rise in the future, well, that's mitigated by your low and falling intensity of use. Uh, the impact of that on technology costs. So I guess then it, so it helps with that supply demand. Um, well, I was going to use the word equilibrium there, but that's not the right word, equation. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> indeed. Um, so final question, um, and um, feel free not to answer this one, by the way, if you don't feel that you can. So this comes in from Ellie, and Ellie's asking, uh, what do you think the impact of, I guess, changes in terms of government support behind different facilities within the UK are? So we've seen, obviously, announcements of support going into some facilities, being withdrawn from others. Do you have any comments on that? Or are you allowed to make any comments on that? I mean, I can't comment directly on it. We certainly had some support from the Automotive Transformation Fund in putting our hydrogen gigafactory together. That was announced. So, you know, I think what's from a hydrogen perspective, what's coming to the fore is this understanding of the role hydrogen can play and the fact that hydrogen gigafactories are a thing. And, you know, it, from a UK perspective, you've got Johnson Matthew, you've got a lot of companies who are in this hydrogen value chain. It makes sense to put those hydrogen gigafactories here from a UK perspective. A lot of other countries are thinking the same thing. So, I mean, it's a look, it's tough. There's so much, there's so much to do in the energy transition, and there's so much you know, requiring regulator attention there. So it, it's it's quite difficult to ensure you're doing everything perfectly. So, you know, I think that's coming, but, you know, it's the pace at which we have to move here means inevitably there's going to be a bit of figuring things out along the way. Absolutely. Um, so with that, thank you so much, Marge. There are a few more questions in the chat that I haven't managed to be able to get to, but um, on behalf of everybody here, thank you so much. Thank, that was thanks, brilliant. Thank you.